Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Today, we are going to celebrate our Savior's baptism and talk about some very practical things that that means for us. We begin our worship this morning by singing hymn 16. to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. The Lord have mercy on me, a sinner. <laughs> Jesus, Lord, I forgive you all your sins. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Inside my mother, he mentioned my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me a polished arrow. He concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my glory. But I said to myself, I have labored in vain. I spent my strength and came up empty with nothing. Yet a just verdict for me rests with the Lord, and my reward is with my God. But now the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to turn Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him, so that I will be honored in the eyes of the Lord, because my God has been my strength. The Lord said, it is too small a thing that you should just be my servant to raise up, the, to raise up only the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the ones I have preserved in Israel. So I will appoint you to be a light for the nations, so that my salvation will be known to the end of the earth. So far the reading, we continue with the psalm of the day. Psalm 45 on page 83 in the front part of your hand.
basis for today's sermon is taken from the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 25 through 34. We read, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Instantly all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself because we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell down trembling in front of Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to everyone in his home. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Without delay, he and all his family were baptized. Then he brought Paul and Silas into his house and set food before them. He rejoiced because he and his whole family had come to believe in God. So far the reading. Hallelujah. I will appoint you to be a light for the nations, so that my salvation will be known to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. 
question on the lips of the jailer in Philippi, and that is the question on which the entire reading hinges. But it is the wrong question, and it's asking in a weird place. Now, as the reading opens, we see Paul and Silas in prison. These men had not done something horrible. These were not awful criminals. They were in prison, as you well know, for preaching God's word. This wasn't the first time it happened, and it will not be the last time they were in prison. They were in prison more than some criminals, but they did not act like criminals. There was no bitterness, there was no resentment, no anger, no shouting 
at the jailer talking to him, no complaining about the unfairness of their sentence, no <clears throat> plotting to escape. Instead, they did something that served as an inspiration for people all throughout time. When I was getting ready to go over in China, uh, we had a friend who mentioned that she belonged to a church at one point, and that church, well, the people there got arrested. And when they were arrested and taken to jail for worshiping illegally, they followed Paul and Silas' example. They were singing hymns and praying and talking to each other about God. And the jailer in that Chinese prison had a reaction, I'm guessing, very similar to what this Philippian jailer's reaction must have been. He started shaking his head and muttered out loud, this is the strangest day. You can imagine that being the Philippian jailer's reaction too. It was a strange day. He had never seen prisoners behave like this. He had never seen incarcerated people, and he'd seen plenty of incarcerated people, act like this, praising God, talking about God, singing to God. And he must have thought, well, this is weird. This is different. But probably didn't give it a ton of thought. <coughs> Until what happened? happened. Midnight, something miraculous happened. We have no idea if Paul and Silas knew this was coming or not. It's not made clear in the text. But all of a sudden, there was an earthquake. And this wasn't a normal earthquake. This was the kind of earthquake that, you know, opens doors and knocks chains off of people. In other words, a miracle. This is the sort of earthquake that could not exist unless God specifically intervened. And the jailer, it was midnight, he was probably dozing. The prisoners were locked up safely. There was no reason for him to be awake. But when the earth shook, he sprang to wakefulness and called for lights. And when the lights came on, he saw the worst possible thing. The worst possible thing that could have happened to this poor jailer happened that night. All of the doors were open and that meant the prisoners escaped. Now the penalty for an escape, for letting prisoners escape back in those days was death. So the jailer did something that I suspect many people would be tempted to do in that situation. Skip all the way to the end of the book and take care of it himself. And that's when Paul stood up and saved the man's life. Shouted, no, stop, don't do it. Do not harm yourself. We're all still here. And in a night of weird things that were happening to this man, this was by far the weirdest. If you were in prison and all of a sudden your door was open, would you not walk out? I suspect I probably would, but none of those prisoners did. And that jailer knew something incredible was happening, and he went to Paul and Silas, fell at their feet, and asked a question that logically most of us would ask. What must I do to be saved? Brothers and sisters, that is the wrong question. One of the most common pieces of relationship advice anyone who's tasked with speaking on relationships will give is watch your pronoun. Think about it. In any relationship, the best way to kill it is with one word, one letter. Ah. What do I, what do I need? What would make me happy? How can I be the most fulfilled? I, 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 when it becomes about you, 
it's going to ruin your relationship, whether it's a business partnership, a friendship, or a romantic relationship, it doesn't matter. Making it about yourself will kill it, and nowhere is that more true than in your relationship with God. Think about it. How many times have you heard someone say, how many times have you heard someone put out there, how many times have you yourself thought, yeah, yeah, I know the Bible says this or that or the other thing, but I think it should be like this. Or, yes, I know God says I shouldn't do that, but that book was written 2,000 years ago, so I think I can do this. Or, what the Bible says doesn't fit society, so I know I am allowed to do this. I think, I think, I know. What makes you special? What makes you so important? Do you honestly believe that you know more than God? Because when you and I think that way, that's what we're saying. We are elevating ourselves literally above God. Interpreting his word by, by our own subjective thoughts and subjective feelings. It becomes about me. Even when we come to realize that we have done something wrong. Even when we come to realize that we have sinned, even when we come to realize that we have somehow in some way failed our God, even then, what is the question that we ask? Is it not more often than not the question the jailer has to live by asked? What must I do to be saved? What must I do? How can I fix this? It's again about me. It's again about something I do. And when you ask that question, it's about what you do. It's about who you are. And that is the best way to kill your relationship with God. Because it's not about you. It's about him. It's about what he does. It's about the people. And Paul makes that clear in his answer to him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That sounds like something you do. Believe. Believe. That's an imperative, a command. Believe. You. Believe. So isn't that something we do? No. The Bible makes clear throughout that those who are without faith are dead. In their sins. Now there's not much a dead body can accomplish. In fact, they can't do anything but fruit. And that's what we can do. By nature, that's what we can do. When God's words come to us, either we resist them, we fight them off, or faith is created in us by the Holy Spirit. So believing is not something you do. It is a gift from God. It is something he does for you. That means that believing, when Paul says here to believe, he is saying there is nothing for you to do. And that tracks, doesn't that? That tracks with all the rest of Scripture, because what does Scripture make abundantly clear? That there is nothing you can do, and there is nothing you need to do, because it has all been done for you. Everything has been accomplished for you. What must I do to be saved? Nothing, because Jesus has already done it for you, all of your sins, all of your desires, all of the times where you try to elevate yourself or your thoughts above God and his thoughts. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all of those sins. He wiped them away forever. They're gone. And because of that, your life has changed. 
And you see that again in this jailer in Philippi. Before that earthquake, he never would have thought of inviting a prisoner into his house. Now, he not only invited these two prisoners in, he woke up his family so they could hear what these prisoners had to say. He couldn't have cared less that Paul and Silas had been beaten up, that they had wounds, that they might be hungry. Now, he not only had their wounds cleaned, he cleaned them himself and then put food in front of them because they were a little peckish. This man's life had changed. In what other ways it manifested itself, we don't know. This is the last we hear of this particular jailer. But his example still serves as a beautiful, a brilliant example for you and for me. Whose wounds have you cleaned recently? Okay, maybe you don't work in a hospital, but I'm not speaking literally. Who have you helped out? Who have you served? What downtrodden person have you reached out to? What person have you brought nourishment, either for their bodies or even more importantly, for their souls? Who have you reached out to to tell them about their Savior? Who have you brought to church? Who have you shown <clears throat> some passages in the Bible or discussed things with? Who have you fed? Whose wounds have you cleaned? Cleaned either literally or more importantly, told them that their sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. This is the way that Taylor's life has changed. In each and every one of you who believe in Jesus Christ, your life has changed just as much as his man. And he shows you the type of fruits, the type of actions, the type of things that you can receive, that you can more importantly do for each other. There are opportunities this afternoon, well, hopefully not too deep into the afternoon, but after church today, we are going to talk about some ideas, some projects that we can have going forward here to reach out to serve our community. There's a sign up list for cleaning the church. Clean the church a couple times a month, maybe. It has no names on it, or at least did it as of yesterday. There are ways for you to serve. There are ways for you to express your love for all of the things God has done for you. Look at yourself, look in your heart, look in the ways you have been uniquely blessed by your God and find a way to serve with them. Because your God loves you, loves you enough to do literally everything for you. So now you get to dedicate your life to him. That is the jailer and the God's lesson for each and every one of us. That's very important to take that lesson to heart. Amen. Now may the grace of God which transcends all human understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise we continue by singing the creative <laughs>
church today, we will be using the prayer of the church for Epiphany, found on page 124 in the front part of your hymnal. The prayer of the church for Epiphany, page 124. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, in the fullness of time, you came into our world to save us from sin and death. Beloved Son of the Father, revered by the Magi, baptized by John, you came preaching and teaching, healing and comforting, forgiving and encouraging. You brought the light of life to those walking in darkness, and the joy of salvation to those doomed to death. Prince of Peace, shine like a beacon for us and for the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. Open our own lips to speak your name to those around us who still live without faith or hope. Turn our own lips and our nation, Mary, to the world with the light of your gospel. Lord of the Church, let your peace rule our hearts that we may use our gifts to serve you and each other in willing gratitude and joy. Watch over our loved ones, near and far that they may remember your love and rejoice in your salvation. Strengthen the faith of the sick and the disheartened. Give hope to those who in despair and comfort those who mourn. Dear Lord, we need us with those who are still recovering from surgery, Janice Steyer, Ruth Hilgis, Spread their bodies full of healing and bring them back to serve you in the ways that they are used to. But overall, Lord, please give them peace and patience. And I want them to understand that your timing may not be theirs, but you know what is best, and they know. Lord, we also ask that you be with Doug and Mary Lamb here as they. Struggle with their various health remedies, health uh, maladies. We ask that you give the doctors wisdom and insight that they may find the proper remedy and bring them to healing quickly. And hear us, Lord, as we, as we bring you our prayer to this day. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home, where we will stand in the full light of your glory, and with all your saints and angels to the everlasting song of Christ. Amen. And we pray the prayer our Savior is taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts.
came to me to take my body and to gain to me. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way afterwards he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it all. This is my blood, which the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
his own body and blood, your Savior gives you the peace, the comfort, the hope, and the joy that you need to get through this and every single day. Because the promise he has given to you is true, it is real, and it is yours. Your sins are forgiven. You are at peace with God. Depart from this, your Savior's table, and that be true. Amen. We continue with the Thanksgiving portion on page 24 from our reading.
morning. And thank you for joining us for worship this morning. It is truly a pleasure having you all here. A few announcements. First of all, we have our voters meeting today after the service. So if you'd like to stick around. Second of all, after my term in seven is over, so February 21st, we will be starting up Sunday morning Bible classes at 9 a.m. Apparently my son has an announcement in a moment as well. Uh, so please feel free to join us for those. We will be continuing our Wednesday morning class. Uh, Wednesday morning. No one's come to Wednesday morning. Apparently we're not off Wednesday evening courses as well. And any other announcements I may have will be made tomorrow in our email because, well, we're going to be deciding a few things today at the meeting, I think. So, that's all I got. Is there something I should be announcing? I forgot. Not seeing anything. May God bless you. See you in the past.